Welcome everybody to this morning's event. So, so, so happy that you're all here on this lovely, glorious sunny morning in Stockholm. So today I'm gonna to be your host, your moderator for this event. My name's Fiona. I am from a company called Remote. Now, in case you're wondering, who is remote? We're actually partners to the lovely Jobalon and the lovely Hi Bob, uh, who are speaking here today. And we help companies hire and pay people all over the world, employees and contractors. And we're also, as the name might give away, remote, a fully remote company. So like not a single office anywhere in the world. We have people as far flung as the Azores, Stockholm, Scotland, Japan, you name it, we are absolutely everywhere. But of course, in a fully remote org, there are two things that you really, really need. And that's trust and that's transparency. In fact, transparency is one of our core values at Remote. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, moderating this how to build a people first culture based on trust and transparency session. So how's it going to work? We're going to start off with three keynote speakers. We have the wonderful uh, Jean from LinkedIn. He's giving a wave. He's going he's gonna to kick us off today with some trends. And then we're going to have a keynote speaker from uh, Hi Bob. Where are you, Sarah? There she is. <laughs> and then last but not least, we will have the wonderful Arif and Karin from Jobilon. So we'll start big and then we'll drill down and get a little bit more tactical and tangible. After that, we'll have a panel session. We've already received some fantastic questions from you all. So thanks so much for sending them in advance for those who have. We will see timing wise how it goes if we'll have the opportunity to take um, questions from the audience. But if you don't get the opportunity to ask a question, fear not because we then have half an hour of mingle time afterwards. So feel free to come and speak to any of us about trust, transparency, remote, HR tech, you name it. We've got uh, lots of things to talk about. Housekeeping, feel free to help yourself to some coffee, more refills of breakfast, lovely juices. And then of course we have the bathrooms out there in the hallway. So I think without further ado, maybe we'll kick us off. So keynote speaker number one, I think it's fairly safe to say that everyone in this room has a LinkedIn profile, right? Is there anyone who doesn't have a LinkedIn profile? No, no hands, phew, we're in the right audience here. And LinkedIn, I mean, how often do you spend time on LinkedIn? Quite a lot, right? And you're like liking things and commenting on things. And LinkedIn sees all of this, however many hundreds of millions of members there now are on the platform. So LinkedIn sees all of this and sits on a lot of trends. So why not have Jean up to come and talk about some of these amazing trends? But before we begin, Jean, what's not on your LinkedIn profile? <laughs> oh, the, the list is, I would say, quite embarrassing, but uh, uh, many things. Uh, do I have to pick one now? Like, yeah, please. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I've served uh, uh, the actor Sean Penn Cappuccino. Oh, very cool. Okay, well, see if you can now top that with your with your keynote. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, by the way, can everyone hear my voice? Uh, because there was a mic here, but the problem is, I love using my hands, so I was like. I can't just have a mic in my hand, but if, if there's some issues with you not hearing me, please raise your hands if you're in the back. Anyway, uh, thanks for getting this opportunity to be here and share a little bit of uh, maybe some of my personal thoughts. There's lots of trends out there at LinkedIn. We love data, we love trends, we love people. And, uh, and uh, what I wanted to do today is maybe share three workplace trends that we are seeing 
uh, either are growing phenomenally or we see they have a huge impact on, uh, on today and tomorrow. Uh, before we go into that, I can just stand here and not talk about a little bit about macro and what we've been going through over the past three years. It's truly been a very disruptive uh, years in the labor market. If you think about the COVID, when it kicked in, we had tremendous you know, drop in some areas of the, uh, of the market. If you look at like hospitality, you look at, you know, um, uh, for example, tech uh, and so on, there is a big, big fluctuation in uh, how uh, talent flow was working. And uh, if you just looked at Sweden, I think we went in the COVID year, we, uh, the uh, unemployment increased by 25%. So it was a, it's a huge disruption. Uh, fast forward a little bit, then we started to come out of the COVID. Now there is a boom. We've been waiting, we're doing a lot of stuff. And then there's a big shift in terms of how people were buying things and what type of things they're buying and services and so on. So it was a huge shift. Thinking about it, you know, like uh, e-commerce, uh, which in Sweden, actually 85% of, of the population know have bought or know how to buy something online. But those type of jobs on our platform like increased by like 100%. So there is a big shift in different areas. And then something happened. Well, there was a war, there is an economic landscape that changed. And um, inflation went up. If you look at it in Sweden, you hear it all day, interest rates are going up. And what we can see right now uh, is that there's a big disruption in the, in the labor market in terms of that movements are not happening that much. In t if you look at jobs on LinkedIn and we measure um, how people are actually changing jobs. So if you look at it, how people are changing jobs, it actually in Sweden, it went down, the movement went down March to March last year by 35%. Now, saying that, uh, LinkedIn has uh, about, to see where the data comes from, to give you a perspective, I have about 970 million members globally. And in fact, actually, yesterday, I got it uh, uh, official that in Sweden, we just passed 5 million. To give you a perspective of that, the working population in Sweden between the age of 16 and 74 is around some point of 5.4 million. So this means about 95%, average of 95% of those are on LinkedIn. Now, why am I telling you this? Because these disruptions is gonna come into some of the things that changed. During the COVID, we came into some paradoxes. One of the paradoxes was that people had to work from home or had to work in a hybrid landscape. And what we started seeing is, uh, let's see if this works. There you go. So what we started seeing is something what we call, uh, or actually Microsoft CEO called uh, productivity paranoia. And what does that mean? If you look at labor market uh, roles, um, remote jobs went from before COVID 2% on the platform to 20% during COVID and then start coming back at 15% and, uh, and so on. If you look at it, People are working from home or remote. Employees, what happened? Well, meetings, actually, if you look at some Microsoft data, meetings increased during the COVID time by 150% in Outlook. Managers start feeling that when the economic landscape is like this, is that we're not productive enough. We don't know what our employees are doing. I don't see them. I don't know where they are. I don't know what's happening. Are they working the hours in their productivity is low? A, a big report that uh, Microsoft and LinkedIn has conducted, it shows that 12% of the managers felt their, their, their employees were, were you know, actually uh, quite um, uh, productive during having a hybrid remote uh, work. Whereas 87% of the employees felt they'd be more productive by having that set up. Actually, a lot of them also raised concerns about that uh, their, uh, their um, that, that it's uh, actually affecting their well-being as well because they're working so much. So why is that? Well, the thing is that one of the biggest issues is that we as managers or organizations, we are very trained into following tasks and measure tasks instead of outcome. So that's one thing that we need to start looking at to be able to 
follow what the outcome and have the right tools to measure that outcome. But the second and most important thing is how do we build trust? How can we build trust between managers and employees, between the organization and employers and, and, the, and the people that are working there? And you're going to hear some great examples today on how to do that. And uh, I think it's fundamental to, to think about that, both as leaders and organization, that trust and tr trust comes that we need to find and give vulnerability and, uh, and uh, spend time and actually on building that. Um, the second thing I wanted to share, this clicker is not really helping me that much. Uh, oh, am I pointing in the wrong direction? Oh, there you go. Well, up, up. Hold on, hold on. There you go. No. There you go, thank you. Actually, that one also went off, so just so you know. Yeah. Uh, Fiona, if you need to take me off stage, just let me know because the timer is off. Uh, the second thing is to think about is that, okay, now if people have to come into the office, people actually come in for people. Generations, if you look at generations, you hear a lot of things about Generation Z. Why? Because actually to some reports by 2030, about 30% 30 of the working population is going to be Generation Z. We're actually going to be in a, uh, in a stage where we need to, we have a lot of generations working together and we need to actually create a fundamental of how to work together. One of the things that is very important to look from Generation Z is that they're very value based. Actually, they say 80% say that when they're looking at jobs and workplaces, it needs to be very aligned with their values. The second thing is that by half of that generation, actually, they feel that there needs to be a true uh, transparency and authenticity in companies' culture when it comes to social and environmental uh, stakes. So to be able to attract people to the office or create that, we need to create a people-centric culture. Some of our reports actually are showing that about 82% of all companies wanted to do that, but they have a big challenge. How do you create that? Well, the thing is that you need to build on social skills. How do you build your social capital? If we look at, uh, we have a learning platform that has about like uh, 20,000 uh, uh, learning courses, both technical and also soft skills, so hard on soft skills. If we look at the data from that, we see that some of the top skills actually acquired people are learning globally is soft skills. And so do we have the right platform and do we have the right way of engaging and building discussions around diversity, equity, inclusion, about how to drive a people-centric organization? Because that's what people are coming for, not for the free lunches. It'll help. It's a free breakfast at least helps. That's why you're here, right? For the free breakfast. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Next one, thank you. The third one is one of my favorites. What I told you about the macroeconomic condition, unemployment rate, surprisingly, for the first time since many, many times when we go through recession, unemployment rate is quite actually low across the markets. But the, but the need for talent and the need for jobs is very high. So we actually have a par another paradox in terms of like people are not moving around, but we need to hire people. So what does that mean? What it means also that because of the economical landscape, we might have less budgets also to, to uh, acquire people. You're even some of you actually are sitting in organizations where you have hiring freeze. So what we need to do is we need to think about how to upskill and reskill our organization. If you look at the skill set change, since 2015, about 25% uh, about of the skills has changed for jobs. If you look at it by 2027, about, that's going to double. So it's going to be about 50% of skills that's going to change by that time. If you look at the half lifetime cycle of a skill, it's at five years right now. If you look at technical skills, I even read at some report, it's around like two, two and a half years. So imagine like people going to the university, by the time they come out, there's already too late like working with that. So we need to have as organization and people a way of working with skills. Now, there's two things around it. One is how do we actually identify people and talent? Are we identifying them by their experiences or are we identifying them by the skill set that they have? Both at recruitment, but also internally. Do we even have an understanding of what are the skill sets that our organization and the people have today for that role or job? Are we writing job descriptions based on what things need to happen or should we write a skills description? 
The most important thing to crack that code is to work with skill-based recruitment or skill-based internal development. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that we need to identify the skill sets that are important for a job and for the future, and we need to search people uh, after that. If you look at on our platform, it's very easy to see that if you move from a job title or experience way of searching for people into a skill base, you're going to increase your talent pipeline by 10x. But also, when people come in, you need to now develop uh, skill sets. If you look at some of the reports that have been on, for example, on um, LinkedIn uh, has an annual report around uh, like learning, a work workplace learning uh, global report. It says on that that actually three of the five uh, reasons why people stay at a job or go to a job is tied to uh, skills development. So it's about having a challenging and, and a meaningful uh, job. It's about growing your career. It's about developing a skill set or acquiring a skill set. So actually within like internal mobility is one of the fundamental most important thing right now. If you cannot recruit outside, you need to recruit inside. So how do you develop skills? But how do you identify skills? We, have, we can see a lot of organizations, actually, especially big, large global organizations, they're using the platform, actually our solution, to find talent within their own organization based on skills. How can I find this person? Okay, this person is sitting in Singapore. You should move to Nordics. We have a great opportunity for them here. Or even within my team, how does that look? And so on. So, Defining and how to recruiting, you know, your own employees needs to be tied. If I do we understand, do we know what type of skill sets is needed today and how can we develop and create environment, a platform, so a learning culture. And how do you define that? How do you create that learning culture, which is actually very tied to the people culture? Well, one thing I have an advice for many of you that are working in general, everyone, but very specifically into the talent acquisition industry or HR, is there's one skill set you need to develop that is going to be fundamental for you in your role going, going in the future. And that skill set is data literacy. If you cannot articulate work with data in your role, you are going to be having a very, very hard time to persuade your organization on what direction they're going to go and to even have the language to be able to make your point going forward. And data and insights is what's going to drive your strategy to go forward and making sure you're getting what you're, the support that you need. And by the way, it is the one of the most important things that the CEOs are thinking about is the people strategy, right? That's the top three. So your role is extremely important in this disruptive matter to be able to change the way your behavior of how you've been working before and try to adapt your new skill set, but also making sure that you're working with the skills-based uh, competency, skills-based search, skills-based development. Thank you very much. I hope I'm not screaming or yelling too much. Uh, Fiona, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, John. Gr great insights, as always. And uh, bang on schedule, absolutely love it. Makes my job very easy here today. Now, who's up next? Hi, Bob. Do you all know Hi, Bob? So cool. So they're here to um, really reshape the future of HR. One of the easiest platforms, loveliest platforms I've ever seen. Uh, everything all in the one space, you know, manage all your talent, performance. It really is you know, driving the heart of HR. So it's not surprising, therefore, that their bar is set extremely high when it comes to their own internal culture. And I couldn't be happier, actually, to, uh, to introduce Sarah, CMO, for HiBob today, to tell you about that, what they've been up to over at HiBob to really raise that bar. But before we get started, Sarah, don't think you're getting out of this. What is not on your LinkedIn profile? Uh, so good question. Um, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you can see that I have a university degree in uh, history and classical studies, which is uh, dead languages. Uh, I am also, though, a culinary school dropout. 
and very proud of it. I'm actually married to an ex-professional chef, so we do a lot of eating and drinking at my house. Um, but I, uh, culinary school wasn't what I wanted to do with my career, so it doesn't maybe appear on my uh, LinkedIn profile, but it's something that I take advantage of certainly when I make dinner every night. And I hope that was meatballs in Sweden last night, <laughs> right? I think it was pizza. <laughs> <laughs> pizza, meatball pizza. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. Uh, just before we begin, how am I advancing slides? Okay. And point it at this thing. All right. I'm on it. We're going to do our best here. Uh, I'm also going to project my voice uh, with my loud American accent. So uh, hopefully you all can hear me uh, even from the back. Uh, my name is uh, Sarah Reynolds. Maybe. No. Is it? Thank you. Do you want me to just advance on the on the computer? Maybe that's is okay. Good. Well, I can stand here too. If you want. Well, I'll work. I'll walk around. All right. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Hi. My name is Sarah Reynolds. Uh, I am Chief Marketing Officer at HiBob, which is a modern HR platform for the types of companies that you all represent, which is types of companies who really want to be people first, who really care about their people, and who are looking for great HR solutions that employees actually love to use, as opposed to feel like they have to use. Uh, my pronouns in English are they and them. If you want to speak about me in Swedish, I understand that it's hen. Uh, is the gender uh, neutral. Um, I am very proudly non-binary, uh, which means that I don't see gender as one of two options in the world. I see it as a beautiful spectrum, and I see that I fall somewhere on that spectrum. It informs a lot of the work that I do. I'm super passionate, as you can imagine, about DE&I. Um, and we're going to talk in today's presentation about all of the great work that Hi Bob is doing uh, and my HR team is doing. Um, but I'm also going to share a little bit about what we're doing to talk about DE&I specifically, because I think that it, it plays into um, how we think about trust and transparency and building great culture at Hi Bob. So um, I don't need to tell all of you who think about this every day that great culture is a must. Um, but I really think that it's important to underscore about you know, the way that we feel at work is often the best definition of our company culture. Um, you can see lots of different commentary about like what is culture made up of. But I think that for us, it's about how our employees feel about the job that they do. And the way that we talk about culture is that it's integral to driving business performance because how we feel about work uh, really reflects the work that we do or really reflects our ability to deliver great work to the organization. You all know that if you have a challenging day at work, it can feel hard to go back into your email inbox and continue to uh, work on work through responses to coworkers or continue to dive back into that Excel spreadsheet and look at data when you're having a challenging uh, challenging day at the office. And that's why we feel like we want to create those great experiences for people to make sure that they feel really welcome, they feel really able to deliver their best work, and ultimately that we can help them and help our business deliver like better productivity, um, obviously higher employee retention, uh, which in the current economic climate is so critical to us, um, and that we can really create resilient teams so that when things do change, uh, Jean talked about all the changes that we're seeing right now in the market, um, change is the only new normal, and we want to create a culture where resilience is prioritized. I'm here to maybe tell you a secret or tell you my opinion about this, which is um, I have the opportunity to work with lots of great HR leaders, not just at HiBob, but also with all of our customers. And um, one of the things I hear from them in high growth periods, when they're recruiting a lot, when they're adding a lot of new people to the organization, is how challenging it is to maintain culture as they grow. Um, that means, though, that when we're in periods like right now, where maybe you are facing a hiring freeze, or maybe the, eco the economy has slowed down a little bit for your organization, that means that now you have a tremendous opportunity to actually build culture. So even if you're growing at a slightly slower rate, or maybe you're not growing at all, it's time and it's space that you have as HR leaders to build and cultivate that culture in your organization. Um, and again, when you're thinking about you know, the things that your 
chief financial officer or your CEO is really concerned about. It's about tying that culture back and tying that work that you want to do during this period to those three things that we talked about. How do I drive productivity? How do I drive retention? And how do I drive organizational resilience or resilient teams? Because in messaging back to the organization why you're going to be focusing on culture at this specific time, you want to speak the language of the business. And you want to be able to communicate with them about like not just a, a culture topic, but also a, a P&L impact uh, that they're going to see from this specific work in this period of slower growth. So again, great culture is a must. Why? How, how do we get great culture? Well, if you look at data from employees, as Jean mentioned, obviously transparency and trust is really critical. So um, we looked at a study from Indeed and Forrester in this case. But if you look at the things that employees say that they want from a great culture, it's trust primarily, it's energy in the organization, the right vibe. They want to feel that sense of belonging. They want flexibility. And of course, they want fair pay. And as John also mentioned, um, one of the reasons that flexibility and one of the reasons that trust is so important is whether you have a work from the office policy, you have a hybrid work policy, or maybe like Hi Bob, you've adopted a work from anywhere policy. It's really important that your managers and your employees are on the same page about where they are working and how that contributes to trust and or how that puts concerns uh, in the water stream for different employees and their managers about trust. So um, Jean mentioned some data that shows that employees and managers feel very differently about how work from home influences their productivity, right? And when we, we start to think as an organization about that trust and transparency that we need to create, our job as people leaders and our job as managers and our job as HR professionals is to think about how do we pull these numbers closer together and how do we create a situation where employees feel like they are given the trust to do their work, and managers also feel like they see the results of that work. And they're not coming back to say, hey, just because we don't have employees in the office doesn't mean that they're not getting work done. So um, if you don't know Bob, uh, we have quite a large presence in the Nordics. Uh, Bob, as I mentioned, is an HR platform. Um, but really, what I wanted to do today was take the opportunity to share how we um, drink our own Merlot or how we put our money where our mouth is, uh, depending on your favorite English phrase, when it comes to Hi Bob's uh, people and culture team, and how we actually encourage trust, transparency, and communication uh, to empower and retain our people and drive that business performance that I talked about. So the first thing that I think is so critical when we're talking about trust is that it's embedded in our values. At Hi Bob, if you go on our recruiting site, it says, we don't want values to just be words on a poster. We want our values to represent the actual culture within the organization, and we want them to be um, part of the way that we get work done. So we have um, two values that are really specific to today's topic. We have one around trusting and empowering each other, and one around interacting with transparency and openness. Um, when we think about our values, one of the ways that we make sure that values don't just become words on a poster is that we actually integrate them into performance management. So we're going through our performance management process right now. And one of the things that we ask both employees and their managers to comment on is how they represent Hi Bob's values over the last whatever your evaluation period is for us, it's six months. So we think about not just establishing the right values for our organization, but also making sure that they inform the work that we do and inform our measurement or our evaluation of how employees are integrating into our culture. We also, um, we have the great benefit of having, I think, seven offices worldwide. We have employees from more than 50 nationalities at Hi Bob. That means that when we think about trust and transparency and communication, it means we have to work a little bit harder sometimes to make sure that we are really effectively communicating across language, across time zone, across cultural differences. So one of the things that we've put into place to help encourage that trust and open communication and to maybe break down some of those 
barriers or miscommunications that can happen when you have a really beautiful, global, diverse workforce is we've put into place some cultural intelligence training. Uh, in our case, it's based on the work of an organization called Culture Map. Um, and they think about cultural intelligence the same way that you might think about emotional intelligence. So instead of EQ, it's CQ. And for us, what we did was we built a pilot program. We're a big believer at Hi Bob that your people strategy doesn't have to be perfect or fully baked before it launches. We don't uh, let perfection become the enemy of the good. So we do a lot of piloting of programs. And we're very open with employees that they're participating in a pilot and that pilots mean it's not fully baked. But in our case, we did a pilot of our cultural intelligence training before we baked it into our full employee experience. Our cultural intelligence pilot was 40 employees from around the world, representing many different cultures. And we put them through uh, a two hour workshop on cultural intelligence. And we talked about how, where do miscommunications that are related to cultural intelligence happen in the workplace. This was really successful for us. Um, our team loved it. They gave really great feedback. In, as part of our pilot process, we always ask the, the employees who participate to give that feedback to us about what was good, what was challenging, what needs some more thought before it gets rolled out. Um, and I'm very happy to say that we are um, we're launching as part of our uh, internal learning management system launched later this year, a full set of coursework on cultural intelligence that was informed by, you know, not just Culture Map and the great material that they brought to uh, to the uh, to the project, but also from our employee feedback on, you know, what was valuable, what wasn't valuable, maybe in that material as well. Also, as part of that uh, learning management system launch, uh, Jean talked about uh, LinkedIn Learning and, and how great it is for hard and soft skills. Uh, we want to focus on some of those soft skills uh, in the, the LMS content that we make available to all of our employees at HiBob. Um, unconscious bias is something that, along with cultural intelligence, is really important to us. Um, and it's very important to me personally, uh, because I, I, as I mentioned, I identify as a member of the LGBTQIA community. So unconscious bias is uh, the ways that, without even thinking about it, we accidentally uh, uh, like have uh, biases about different people or different cultures or different uh, folks from different backgrounds um, or folks with different experiences. Uh, and it informs the way that we work. It can be as simple as, um, like a classic example is that uh, little kids um, if you have uh, a, a child who's uh, femme presenting, they might get told that they're bossy. Whereas if it's a masculine presenting child, it's like, oh, he's going to be a great leader, a great CEO one day. Uh, it's the same behavior, but it is characterized differently because of their gender presentation. And that informs things like performance management in the workplace when we grow up to be adults. Uh, it also informs things like hiring and making sure that you have fairness and, and you're not uh, integrating biases into your recruitment process, whether it's at the resume evaluation stage or it's at the interviewing and candidate experience stage. So for us, we wanted to, again, we wanted to pilot some unconscious bias training and we wanted to put in place um, some new uh, hiring uh, best practices and hiring guidelines in a workbook for all of our managers uh, that talk about what is un unconscious bias, train them on you know, what is unconscious bias, how does it affect the hiring process, how does it affect the performance management process, and how can we avoid it? What types of language should we avoid? How do we spot unconscious bias? Because it isn't something that we're you know, proactively thinking about, it's something that just happens. Um, and so again, as part of our internal learning management system launch, we are uh, developing a full coursework around unconscious bias built on some of that pilot work. We also, as part of our focus on culture, know that people managers have the biggest impact on employees' perception of culture in the organization. So as much, as, as much fun as it is to be the chief marketing officer and stand up with my C-suite title and say culture is so important, if our managers aren't living our values and aren't bringing culture to the organization every single day, then ultimately it doesn't matter what words come out of my mouth because the employee experience doesn't represent the actual culture. So we want to invest in our leaders. So if you become a people leader at Hi Bob, you go through um, a two-day training process. You also get integrated into quarterly workshops 
our workshop this quarter for managers is all about mentoring. So in addition to developing their people management skills, we want to encourage them to become mentors and we want them to develop mentoring and coaching skills that can complement people managing skills. So we have them in a full program this quarter designed to focus on mentoring. We also do uh, special uh, leadership offerings for folks who are Director Plus and VP Plus in our organization to try and make sure that it's not just people managers that we're building you know, great skills in, but we're also building great executive leadership skills and a great pipeline of future executive leaders in the organization to be able to, uh, to, be able to bring these values and this culture to life. As great as all of our uh, efforts around transparency and openness and trust in the organization are, we also recognize that not every employee feels empowered to give feedback directly to their manager or to their HR business partner or to me or to our CEO in walking by his office. And we know that in addition to things like our employee engagement survey, where you can write comments that are received anonymously from the organization, we need to create a always on you know, feedback loop that's anonymous for our employees. So one of the features of Bob, our HR platform that we use, is uh, called Your Voice which is any time, day or night, 365 days a year, you can log in and you can submit truly anonymous feedback to the organization about your experience, about something that happened. It's really, it's, it's a free text, open field. So at any time, you don't have to wait for the next people and culture engagement survey to come out. You can submit anonymous feedback to the organization. This has been really valuable for us. Um, employees don't take advantage of it that often. I'm really proud to say that we do have an open and transparent culture where most people feel really empowered to give feedback directly with their name attached. But when we do get anonymous feedback from folks, either on our employee engagement surveys or through your voice, um, it's, very, uh, it's very helpful to us. And it's something that we can really demonstrate to employees that we take action on. So for example, uh, an employee recently gave anonymous feedback about our um, 401k, our retirement uh, policy in the US. And they talked about like, when do we actually as an organization match? Like when do we put money into the account? Uh, many organizations choose to do this like once a year, twice a year, quarterly. Uh, they talked about how empowering it would be or how impactful it would be to their future retirement if we could make those contributions monthly uh, instead of, or quarterly, instead of annually, for example. Um, and we very quickly received this feedback and we went to our CFO to talk about the language of the business and to talk about the impact on free cash flow and the P&L and all that fun stuff in finance land. Uh, but very happy to report that we were actually able to take action on that based on this employee's uh, anonymous feedback. Finally, uh, we take communications really, really seriously. Uh, the reason I know so much about the work of our people and culture team is because I have great partners in people and culture. And as a marketing organization, we have the great uh, luck to get to partner together with them on how do we communicate about all of these different policies, all of these different programs to our employees. We also get to partner on how do we communicate general business updates to our employees? How do we make sure that our leaders are um, uh, translating the messages that we are communicating at the executive level out to their employees? How do we make sure that we have a cadence for things like our all hands? Or how do we make sure that the content in our all hands mirrors the content that our board of directors sees so that employees have full transparency into what we are talking about as a business and what we think are business priorities in our organization? So for us, um, this partnership means that we we, we get the opportunity to think really seriously at the beginning of the year about a full um, communications plan. Like what is our cadence for the all hands? Is it gonna be once a quarter? Is it gonna be uh, once a quarter plus a fireside chat with our CEO on an alternating month? We get to plan it ahead of time and then we get to work ad hoc uh, in advance of each of our employee communication uh, opportunities to be able to design the right type of content. And for us, it is really about you know, trust and transparency. So we really do show our employees the same slides that go to our boards of directors. So if you are thinking about internal comms or if you have uh, internal comms as part of your responsibility, I would say as the marketing professional in the room, take advantage of your friends in marketing. They know a lot about communications and they can help you sort of think through how do we partner together to really bring that communication strategy 
to life. Okay, last but not least, putting it into practice. So Hi Bob's been thinking about this since day one, right, of our employee or of our uh, company journey, because it's really important to us that we think, we think about HR best practices and that we drink our own champagne uh, or we do what we say when it comes to the work of our people and culture team. Um, if you are thinking about putting some of these things into practice in your own organization or you want to build um, some new, maybe focus on trust and transparency into your culture, um, here are a couple of things I would recommend. One is evaluate your values. Uh, if they don't explicitly talk about trust and transparency, figure out are they the right values for you. Um, think about if there's a value that maybe like reflects that but doesn't say it so specifically, how you change the communications around your values, your existing values, to prioritize trust and transparency. Um, train your managers. Your managers are your best uh, face to the organization. They spend the most time with your employees. They are the drivers the, of culture and the translators of messages that you create in HR or your C-suite says to the market or to the employees. Um, train your managers and specifically focus on some of those soft skills that help them to build trust with their employees. Um, make your leadership visible. So make sure that it's not your HR team saying one thing and your CEO saying something else, which is something I'm sure we've all experienced from time to time. Um, but make sure that your leadership team is reflecting your company values, is reflecting the messages you're sending as an HR organization, and hold them accountable for progress. So if you do have uh, something like a change in, in values to focus on trust and transparency, how are you going to go back to the employees three months later, three months after the announcement, and demonstrate to them that this has had an impact, and what role does your leadership team play in communicating that message? Choose the right platform to communicate with your team. Not everything needs to be a meeting. You do need to have opportunities for employees to ask questions or to give feedback anonymously. So think about how you're going to integrate that feedback loop into your, into your process. Um, and then finally, if you don't already have one, set a cadence for company updates. Even if you don't have a full communications plan that comes you know, jointly developed from HR and marketing, even something as simple as having regular company all hands or regular departmental all hands uh, can make a big impact. I can tell you when I joined marketing as a new CMO, one of the things that I learned was that uh, the previous CMO didn't have staff meetings. That sounds outrageous. Uh, but she, she didn't meet with her team weekly, monthly, to give them updates about what was going on in the, in the broader business. She relied on one-to-one -one communication with each of her team members. That had an impact on the team members' ability to build trust with each other and to build open and honest communication and to build collaboration on joint projects. So check in with your leaders about the cadence that they use to communicate to their employees. Because if they don't have a departmental all hands or they don't have uh, team meetings, you're missing a, a tremendous opportunity to build culture. I think that's it for me. Thank you, team, so much. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Of course. Great. Really good. I'm going to use a little pun here. Food for thought there. Perfect. Now, last but not least, I'm delighted again. To, uh, to introduce the wonderful team from Jobalon. Now, fun fact, Jobalon are actually using remote. So I've had the pleasure actually of working very, very closely with Karin here. But before I bring, bring you up onto the stage to talk about happiness culture here at Jobalon, don't think you guys are getting away with this either. <laughs> so, Karin, we go with you first. What's not on your LinkedIn profile? I thought about it during the talks here. <laughs> Hard about it. I would say I'm a karaoke nerd. <laughs> There's no karaoke championships out there, but I know. But if you know any, please let me know so I can maybe participate and add that. Right. You to need to my come, with, come with me yeah. on the Finland ferry sometimes. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Tonight. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Cool. What if? What's not on your LinkedIn profile? Yes, uh, the, the most oddest thing I could think of, this is weird, I think, but I'm saying it anyway. Uh, I asked Tova about this, I was like, can I say this? Uh, so I, I actually had another name until I was two years old, and then my parents changed it. 
Whoa. Wow. There's a story behind it. Wow. Talk about identity yeah. crisis. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. I feel, I feel everyone is trying to get this clicker to work. Yeah. Can we, can we make but, it? Uh, yeah. yeah. Not going to happen. OK. Um, first of all, welcome to our office. Super excited to have you all here. Um, I'm Arif. This is my amazing uh, colleague, Karin. Um, and today we're going to talk a, up about a, very, a lot of transparency we've heard. And we're going to give you kind of the, the transparent and honest story of Jobalon and how we kind of ended up here and how we created what we call our happiness culture. Um, very short about us. Uh, we've done many things in the HR tech space, uh, as I'll tell you in the, in the, in, in the story. Uh, today, what we do, we offer a, a, an applicant tracking system, an ATS, uh, primarily to larger companies uh, all around the world. And this is something we've been doing since 2016, 2017. Uh, but I'm not going to focus too much on that, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit more about our story. So we started 2011. We've always had the same kind of vision and idea to help organizations better attract talent and hiring them in a better and more efficient way. You can do this in many, many ways because this is a very broad uh, kind of vision in that sense. In 2011, our belief was that this would be a um, job board so uh, our first product was a job board with a twist. Uh, we were 13 people, very sales focused. Uh, they didn't know much about product. We thought we had the best idea in the world. Uh, within two years, we realized we don't. Uh, we're really good at selling, but we're creating zero value. So within literally 24 hours, these uh, 13 people became four. That was a strange, weird day. Um, so now we went from a very sales-driven company to a very product-hype-driven company. So now our, our biggest goal was, like, forget money, we want to be on cool news sites, and we want to be the top startups, 30 under 30, under 25, on all of these <laughs> lists. Um, so we created another thing. It, it was called Jobalon Bounty. The idea was that you would connect on Facebook, and your friends would be connected with jobs. You would recommend them to a job. If they get the job, you get the bounty. So we would make everyone into a headhunter. And we got a lot of buzz, and we got on all of these lists and, 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 and all of that. But again, we created uh, zero value. Uh, so four became two. Uh, so now it's survival mode. Uh, we are literally sitting in the corner of another company. They genuinely think we're like the IT department, since they always ask us about the, the printer. And we're working on the next big thing. Uh, and we shifted kind of our culture in a way. We started listening in a different way in terms of what do actually customers want. Uh, and also maybe challenge, challenging them. Uh, uh, and that kind of led us into this realization that, OK, no one seems to be happy with their ATS or the job ad hasn't changed in 200 years. It's gone from offline to online. There is, there is a possibility here. Uh, so long story short, that's, that's kind of when we, in 2014, started thinking about the idea. 2016, we launched what Jobloan is today in a very simple way. So it took us two years uh, where we finally managed to grow the company to five people. For us, this was now we were a team. And if you noticed, Elena here came, came back. Uh, so we, she was our first uh, boomerang. We've had two boomerangs. Um, this is the first time we started talking about happiness, because why would she come back? <laughs> Because everything just, you know, she, she left at the at, you know, rock bottom of the company, uh, had a great job, good career, got married, got a, got a son, and she wanted to come back. Uh, shaky, crazy story, uh, uh, salary not as good, you know, all, all of the above. Uh, but the thing was, uh, the, the, the word happiness came back. I, I, I was more happy. Or, or, and, and for us, happiness is not walking around smiling and laughing, even though that's part of it. But happiness for us is how do you create a, a, a culture where everyone can feel relevant and everyone have impact and, and you're part of a bigger thing in that sense. Um, so that really formed kind of our culture uh, as it is today. And, it, and it's not something you know, we, we, we learned that from, from a lot of failures. And I think you need to do that. I think it's hard to kind of sit one day and workshop your values or, or you know, anything, and then it, and it becomes perfect. So anyway, fast forward to today. 
we are 50 uh, happy Jobilonians all over the, the world, which is super fun. If it's one thing I'm by far most proud of is this team, uh, not the product. The product is something that changes all the time. We've done three products so far. God knows what we're doing in, in three years, though the product is working uh, for the clients in the room. Thank you. Um, but what, what did we learn? I have a lot of animations. So I have to go back and forth. I'll do this. Our learnings during these first years was, they kind of sound obvious, but one, if you iterate enough number of times, at one point you're gonna make it. So the question is kind of like how, when do you stop? When, when, when are you not supposed to do it again? And I remember we had a, a fantastic team and a fantastic board that was always, you know, one, one more time, let's, let's try one more time. And I kept asking them, why are you guys putting in funds in this? Because all the money you're giving us, we're just burning and then it's not working. And, and their answer was very simple, you know, someone will make it, why not us? And, and that just kind of simplified the whole journey. The second thing was that the majority of all companies and startups we saw around us would just cease to exist. Uh, that's just the na name of the game. So the realization for us was what's the point of all of this and of, of working so hard as we do if we're not having fun while we're doing it, if we're not uh, uh, doing it with people that we actually enjoy working with, if we're not doing something valuable. That became again our whole kind of happiness culture. That's, that's the point of all, all of this, uh, basically. Uh, Along the way, our values have always kind of been our North Star, and Karin will talk more about them shortly. I remember when we, uh, we defined these, uh, kind of the first week of the company, I didn't get it. I was like, why are we doing values with three people? Let's just get to work. Uh, I'm really glad that we did that. Uh, I'm really glad today that we did that. Uh, and I think, Sarah, you were mentioning it. Values is just, you know, it's just words, right? No one has bad, no one has be mean. Uh, everyone has good values, but it's all about what do they mean to, to the company, to the people, how do we live our values. So this is something we talk about often, and, and you'll hear that from, from, from Karin also about how we set our performance reviews and salaries and goals, and everything goes back to discussing what is passion for people, what does that even mean? And it has a definition for us in the company, and that definition will change with time. But uh, before I hand it over to uh, Karin, I was about to say cookie, because that's what we call her. <laughs> Nick, Nick. Um, I wanted to share some of, the, some of the happiness initiatives we run. And these are all results from dialogues from, from people in the team and, and weird, quirky stuff we do that we're proud of. One of them is something we call happiness tax. A portion of everything we sell goes to a fund. Uh, we call it happiness tax. Every Friday, we're in this room and people call in and anyone can pitch anything they want uh, as long as, as it has the budget within this fund. And if 50% say yes, we got to do it. Uh, and it's been everything from buying a coffee machine to a pinball game to donating to a cause to a safari in South Africa. Uh, and it's super fun when you empower people to kind of waste money, which was the idea. <laughs> people became more cash conscious. They're like, no, let's save the money. We can go to New York and da, 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 da. So it's always like this dragon's den feeling here every Friday when someone is pitching these. So happiness tax is one. Uh, another one is our uh, protege program. We like to brand everything with our J's. Uh, this is a mentorship program uh, for not only future leaders, but future specialists. And, 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 and you know, uh, so every year we, we match a number of individuals in, 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 company, in the company with executives outside of the company. Uh, so it's a mentor program where they get to meet other people, they work th with them throughout the year, and they, we meet four times a year, all of us, and then we have kind of a big presentation or something uh, uh, by the end of the year. And the last one I'll share with you is uh, our Jcation, uh, which is kind of like our workcation. So this is our, the first one when we were 15, we went to, uh, uh, Prague, because we are a very remote company, we do want to meet up sometimes. So once a year, it's completely optional. We uh, fly everyone into one place. We work for a week together. We hang out. We cook dinners. We you know, do whatever you do at home. But we, it's business as usual. But we do like a hackathon. We do workshops. So this was the first time we got this castle in Prague, which was epic. Then COVID hit. Uh, we didn't do anything for three years. Then we went to South Africa. And this year, I'm not I can't tell you where we're going because no one knows. We're announcing it next uh, week, uh, so you can get back to me then. But these are just some of the, the, you know, the things we do that, that, that no one really thought of. It just came up by discussing and having an open 
uh, you know, transparent culture, because if you think about it, it is weird when someone says like, hey, so a percent of everything we sell, let's just spend it on something. Like it doesn't make sense, but when you start discussing it, it becomes a part of your culture and now it's happiness tax. Uh, but okay, so over to kind of more the science of all of this and, <laughs> and not the, the weird uh, things. Big words say science, but uh, thank you, Arif, uh, for talking about our journey so far and how our happiness culture has been the, the foundation for our growth, basically. And I thought we would just jump into talking a bit more about like how we've been leveraging on our happiness culture in terms of performance. So how do you drive performance? And for us, it's, uh, you can use the word happiness, but for us, it boils down to two words. It's creating meaningfulness and context. So a couple of weeks ago, I watched this documentary about happiness. Some of you might have heard about this documentary before. It was a Harvard University study that looked at the key behind happiness. We all want to know that, right? Looking at this picture here, you could just look at it. I mean, for me, it was true happiness being on a safari with my uh, Jovalon colleagues, if it was just simple as that. Uh, but jokes aside, what they actually found in this study was one thing. One thing that demonstrated importance, uh, and that was meaningfulness and meaningful relationships in particular. And I want to highlight this because if you create meaningful relationships within your teams and also across teams, you will create accountability. And each and every individual in your team will feel that their work actually matters, not only for them. They don't go up in the morning, start working just because they need to reach their KPIs and their goals. They do that and they thrive in their work because they feel meaningful for their colleagues uh, that they hold near and dear. And if we look back, we all know that, I think, sitting in this room, before money was a hedonistic treadmill, today that is replaced by meaningfulness. And not meaningfulness in terms of we need to save the, the world from climate change, of course, that's amazing as well, but more meaningfulness on a micro level. How can I find a company where I actually can see the results and the work I'm doing and feel meaningful. And it is actually the number one reason why employees leave their employers today. So that's why I think it's super important to talk about this. And one thing I think Sarah talked about it a bit that we all can, I think, improve on is training our managers. Because meaningfulness, to feel that genuinely, we need leadership. We need leaders that give recognition. And it's easy to say, I recognize my employees, I give them positive feedback. But for me, you can see it as three different levels. If I take RF as an example, the first level is very plain, very simple. I say to RF, good job. I don't know if that gives you uh, feeling meaningfulness 100%. Yeah, yeah. So if you take it up one level, it's saying, RF, good job. I saw you put a lot of time and effort in that. I recognize his hard work, but that is not enough. We need to push our managers to that third level. And that is all about putting it into a context. Can Arf actually see his work and can he trace back where does his work actually, how does that contribute to the goals? So then I would say to RF, good job. I know you put a lot of time and effort, sweat and tears, but thanks to your good job, now, for example, McDonald's is one of our lighthouse customers. And thanks to that, Jovlon can now grow outside the Nordics. So I think those three levels, at least for me, those are good to have in mind to create meaningfulness. And that will make our feel that his job actually matters uh, in the end. Another thing that we've done at Jovlon to create meaningfulness is something we call context over control. I think many of you in this room have been working in teams, organizations that have been growing rapidly. What happens? We're human beings. The most common thing you do when that happens is that, okay, let's sit down, let's set these uh, different processes, 
let's try to control this mess. <laughs> and the opposite is setting the context, because what happens when you apply too much control? That will lead to less trust, it will lead to less ownership, and again, back to meaningfulness, your employees will feel less meaningfulness, less engaged, and what happens? Your top performers are the first one to leave. And what happens when you leave or lose your top performers? You're left with low or average performers, and you apply even more control. So it's a negative spiral right there. So instead, make sure you, you set a clear context in terms of, of course, like what is the strategy for a company? What are our objectives in the team? I think you all have that. But what I want to highlight, and the most important thing is, on an individual level, because it all starts there, what are the behaviors? Sarah talked about that before as well. Our culture. Okay, we have passion for business product. What is that? What does that mean in terms of actual behaviors? So what we did was that we, we boiled down our behaviors into actual concrete behaviors. And we did that to be able to set the context. So our employees know, okay, what behaviors at Jobalon are required for me? And we actually use this not only when we recruit, when we promote our Proto-J mentorship program, we use it there as well. We assess the employees based on these behaviors. And we even set our salaries based on behaviors. So with that being said, a couple of key takeaways. So as you could tell, talking about our happiness culture, in other words, at Jobalon, for us that means creating meaningfulness and meaningful interpersonal relationships. It could be, for example, a vacation that we do every year. That is an activity that helps us create that togetherness and meaningfulness across our teams. And also put the behaviors in front. Of course, like Sean talked about, we need to measure our outcomes, but it all starts with the behaviors. So it doesn't matter what you do if you cannot measure that. And if you're hesitant, like walking away from this uh, seminar, like, okay, do we have a clear context at, a, at our company? You can actually just easily look at, okay, for example, Trace in your sales team, can she trace back her job to the goals set in your company. And the most important part I would say, and that is can, and does she know what type of behaviors that is required from her? So it doesn't need to be that hard when we talk about purpose, meaningfulness, it sounds big, it sounds fluffy, but I think, yeah, again, it's, it's easy to, to get stuck looking at only outcome raising someone's salary instead of working with purpose. And it doesn't need to be that hard, you just need to focus on the right things, basically. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so some quick questions to wrap up. Um, and thank you again so much for uh, for sending the questions, they were they were great. I'm going to tweak some of them a little bit, just being mindful of time. Sean, I'm going to start off with you. So you talked today a lot about um, having that kind of people-centric company culture. You talked also a lot about skills and that shift towards skills. So, what skills do you think it takes to be a compassionate leader? Um, well, let's uh, maybe I should define a little bit about what compassionate leadership uh, means. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, when you're driving people-centric organizational culture and so on, it's very easy to maybe uh, misperceive that towards that you need to always be accepting whatever the employee is going by or the difficulties and not set boundaries or 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 you know or uh, or at least you need to increase your empathy and um and but you're not really 
taking a step towards some change. So compassionate leadership uh, is, if you think about it, when there's a problem or a situation with an employee, uh, you are showing empathy and you're feeling what that person is going through. Um, but if you're not doing anything about it, it's kind of like you see someone's broken their leg and you're like, oh, I, I know I feel that your leg is hurting, but then you walk away. And for me, compassionate leadership is empathy plus action. So when you see someone, you have a conversation, a vulnerable conversation, a conversation about you know, building trust, but also a conversation about understanding that person and feeling the situation they're in. But it's not enough by feeling that you need to also, as a leader, I think, have the skill set to be able to transfer that empathy into an action that's going to help them get out of that situation or improve better and so on. So the skill set that you were asking about is, well, maybe, and uh, uh, Sarah mentioned as well about like uh, emotional intelligence, you know, cultural intelligence and so on. So from a people manager point of view, you need to definitely develop your um, you know, EQ and understanding about what to, how to build report in terms of, I would say from a leader is transparency and vulnerability. So are you vulnerable enough? And are you transparent about your intent? And that usually starts a way of building trust and then that would lead hopefully to a compassionate leadership where you actually can take actions in difficult situations and not just take action when everything is great. Love it. Thanks so much. Sarah, you're up next. Hello. So considering trust and transparency is such a large part of your company culture at Highbob, what do you think it takes to be a successful leader? I definitely agree with the commentary that it's not just about empathy, but it's also about action. Uh, and I think accountability yeah. would be maybe the, the third thing that I would add there. Um, because I think if you if you don't encourage a culture of accountability with your employees and you don't in make sure that your leaders are truly accountable for the change and the action that they make, then even the action portion can sometimes devolve into, uh, oh, we'll we'll do that. It'll go on the roadmap or, you know, I, I uh, we, we want to make change. Um, so even, you know, when we were chatting, uh, my uh, one of my HR business partners and I about some of the content for today's presentation, mm. um, one of the things that we chatted about was like, how do we give really tangible examples of what we're doing to share with all of you rather than saying things like, you know, we're committed to, to transparency. Um, I think about this you know, specifically, uh, it's Pride Month, yay. Um, and uh, I thought about this a lot during Pride Month because one of the conversations that's happening right now in marketing and in HR is about how companies show up for uh, their LGBTQIA plus employees during Pride Month. Should you change your logo? to a rainbow version. Uh, if you do change your logo to a rainbow version, how do you make sure that it's not just marketing, it's actually representative of your company culture? How do you make sure that you're making inclusion a journey and not a destination? And so I think that you know, when one of the things that we're doing differently this year is we're actually gonna publish a blog that talks about um, not just why did we choose to change our Hi Bob logo for Pride Month, but also what are some of the ways in which we still have progress to be made? Mm. Um, and how are we holding ourselves accountable for progress when it comes to supporting our LGBTQIA plus employees? And so I think that that transparency about the fact that we're not perfect, even though we're, you know, talking about HR best practices and we we really want to be, you know, drinking our own champagne when it comes to those those topics, but but really sharing openly, not just with our employees, but with all of you that we are not a perfect organization and that we still have work to do. And we, you know, our website needs to be more more accessible than it is today. I can, you know, I'm I'm very confident in sharing those types of things with my employees, with the market, um, because I have this unique role. Um, but I, I think it's that accountability, that transparency, and then that accountability for like, okay, so what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Um, and and how are you going to how are you going to measure the impact that really moves the needle? Oh, I'm loving it. Adding the levels on, one more. So empathy, action, accountability, and measurement. I'm loving this. Okay. RF, building on the topic of leadership, if you have to pick one thing, 
What would you say is the most challenging aspect as the CEO in a lead, in leading company that is based on happiness and self-leadership? One thing kind of narrows it down. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> no, but um, I mean, I think first of all, Sarah, you mentioned perfection, right? I think when we all stand up here and like, we set our salaries based on values. Sounds amazing. It, it Like there's so many things left to fix there. And when we talk, I know that the team is sitting there and like, oh, but it's not like that. And I think, I think, <laughs> I think that's part of the happiness culture to have that psychological safety. And like, it is, it's not perfect. So I think communication uh, is, is, you know, um, if, if it's anything we learn from our story is that you just keep changing. It's never going to be perfect, but you can at least kind of aim for, for perfection and be open about it. And every time we launch something, we, we tell people that most likely this will change in three months. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, so it's not a failure. It's just we have to iterate and iterate and iterate and, and just make it better. So I think uh, being open and, and vulnerable with that, uh, with that mindset, I think, is... is um, uh, my kind of key one point or yeah it's perfect and it's a great add-on as well to like everything else you know so after the accountability and the measurement you know adding on that <laughs> we might have to come back and tweak okay last but not least Karin so there's you know many companies out here today and you probably all have, you know, your your cultures and your your way of doing things, you know, at your at your organizations. But what would you give as a piece of advice in if everyone here today wanted to take away some aspects of a happiness culture and to start implementing them into an already established company already with core values and ways of working? Good question. I think RF uh, touched on it a bit. I mean, for us, we didn't sit down and decide, okay, now we're going to create a happiness culture. <laughs> I mean, we've been growing organic and same goes for our culture. It's been an organic journey in terms of like setting our values and everything. And I guess all of you sitting here today, you, you probably have values, but again, we'll go back to like measurement and putting your, your values and especially your behaviors uh, in the front. Uh, and again, this this mindset of like meaningfulness on a micro level instead of this macro level. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I have a lot of friends like several years ago that was like, okay, I need to work at this company that, uh, you know, that's a big change and that will bring meaningful for me. And then they started and they didn't feel any meaning at all. <laughs> so maybe just me personally, but I think you need to focus on like the micro meaningfulness, like what do you do on a day to day basis and try to find those events uh, that bring people together, create that togetherness. And Arvid said it, you need to try things out and adjust and iterate so i think my advice would be if you have values if you have behaviors like look at them and also look at like do they actually generate result also uh, and start there and then see how can we incorporate this in into our day-to-day -day business yeah perfect solid advice thank you so much so i think we've had a lot We've learned a lot today, right? I could see some of you all, you know, avidly taking notes, which has been great. So, um, yeah, I guess it's uh, it's thanks from all of us here. It's been uh, great to have you all here today. Look forward to future sessions, similar sessions. Um, and yeah, stay in touch. Look forward to hearing, you know, how you start to implement empathy, action, <laughs> I feel like I should have written this. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah.